Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, a few introductory remarks about our being in this room in this moment, and then we're going to watch a little uh, video, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, first, for those of you who are visiting with us, we are thrilled you're here. We have uh, red welcome bags on the campus. We would love for you to take one. They contain information, brochures about all the different ministries at All Saints Church. We'd love for you to peruse those, let them call you into deeper engagement at All Saints Church. If uh, you did, if you were here but didn't receive an email from me on Thursday telling you that what we were going to be doing here, then we would like to have you on our mailing list. And we have uh, clipboards over at the table, and they have green sheets where you can give me your name and email address, any other contact information you want to share, and you'll get an email blast from me every Thursday telling you what's going to happen in this room every Sunday. Then finally, um, at All Saints Church, we... Uh, feel called to put our faith into action. We think that's the way to make it work. And we, we have a, a group of policy wonks who tell us, who advise me about what our action should be from Sunday to Sunday. And today we're focusing on taking an action relative to our topic. We have now uh, introduced into the US Congress um, legislation to end racial profiling. It's uh, multifaceted, it's really smart, and obviously we want to organize our energy to put some pressure on um, the House and the Senate to pass this. So you can get more information about it at the action table right here to my immediate left, and also you can sign a petition. Um, are we taking up money? Are you all taking up money for ERD? Okay. And then if you, uh, like all of us, are heartbroken about what's going on in Nepal, we have a way for you to make a contribution to humanitarian relief there. Um, and finally, welcome to those folks who are streaming with us. We have a growing number of people throughout the country and also the world who stream these events and our sermons every Sunday. So. Uh, welcome to you, those of you who are watching us live. So let's uh, watch a four-minute video, and then I'll introduce to you our speaker. This week, this week on Enya Don't Stop, we speak to artist and organizer Patrice Colors Brignac, co-founder of the Black Lives Matter hashtag and movement, and we have Los Angeles' very own Damon Turner, AKA Relate on Rooftop Live. The acquittal of George Zimmerman um, happened last year in 2013. State of Florida versus George Zimmerman. Verdict, we the jury find George Zimmerman not guilty. So say we all four person. Myself and Alicia Garza were over Facebook. We were like, just trying to process out loud on social media with other black people around what the hell just happened. And so we were going back and forth and she writes like a love letter to black folks like, hey, listen, like, I love y'all. And I'm going to always be shocked when they clearly hate us. Um, I'm gonna never um, numb myself because a lot of black folks were like, this is what was gonna happen, what did we expect? And so I wrote her and I was like, thank you so much. And then she wrote Black Lives Matter and then I hashtagged it. Literally within the day, um, I don't even remember how it became like huge, but people started hashtagging it, like Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And then by Monday, I was getting on the radio to talk about this movement called Black Lives Matter. <laughs> and I was like, y'all, Alicia and I are creating this project called Black Lives Matter. We're hoping that more black people than we could ever imagine will join. Um, and then I think by that week, Opal Tometi, the third founder, She's a communications person, and she was like, uh, y'all gotta build an inf infrastructure for this. And so she built the Twitter and the Facebook and the Tumblr. And and, um, and for us, Black Lives Matter from Jump was never just about uh, the killings of young black boys. Um, it was the most, that is the most egregious act, right? The way that lynching was the most egregious act of uh, the Jim Crow South. But rather, Black Lives Matter is a call to action for all black lives. My conversation is always, if all lives matter, we would not need a hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, and if all lives matter, then you're gonna fight like hell for black lives. 
So three women created Black Lives Matter, hashtag slash network, movement, however you want to name it. Two of which are queer, myself and Alicia Garza are, are out queer women. We felt like there wasn't a black movement that was looking at the relevancy of women and also the importance we play in the movement. And there sure as hell wasn't a black movement that was looking at black trans people. Mm -hmm. And that it was both our obligation, our duty, um, and uh, sort of our work to move the narrative forward to say all black lives matter. We're generating a new politic around what we mean by all black lives. And the other thing, thing I think it's important that I think connects to all black lives is we're also trying to build a new way of building leadership. I'm not the leader of the movement. Like, I'm one of many leaders. We have lots of folks in Black Lives Matter who are Afro-Latinos. We have folks at Black Lives Matter who are, um, we have a chapter in Ghana, right? And so Haiti just hashtagged it, I think a day ago, they had the sign Ferguson to Haiti, Black Lives Matter. So the concept of, of blackness and anti-blackness resonates across the globe. And we're hoping to really push that because it could be easy to get bogged down in a very U.S. framework. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we actually need to broaden our scope. The biggest thing for me is building power um, in our communities. I think this is, um, in this moment, um, we have a prime opportunity to really build alliances with Latino communities in this country in particular. Um, I think we have an opportunity to start building towards a broader uh, program around when we're talking about black lives, what do we actually mean by that? Um, the fight for housing, the fight for food, the fight for um, access to education. How do we actually change the culture of this nation? How do we change the culture, the international scope of anti-blackness? And part of that is taking space, taking the streets. The reason why Ferguson was so powerful is because people didn't go back into their homes. They put a curfew on people. People didn't leave. They tear gas people, people didn't leave. They rubber bulleted them, they brought out the National Guard, they brought out every single piece of law enforcement from every part of St. Louis and people stayed out in the streets. And then folks were like, oh, they're not leaving. That means they're not giving up. The marching and the protesting and the taking of the streets is critical uh, when we're trying to engage changing the culture of a people that will eventually change policy. I am thrilled to honor one of the founders of uh, Black Lives Matter, founded in 2013. Um, Patrice Cullors has been on the ground in cities across the country, providing support to those who've taken action and responded to the ongoing virulent and black anti-black racism permeating our society. She and her team brought together more than 600 people from across the country to take part in the Black Lives Matter Freedom Ride from St. Louis to Ferguson in the fall of 2014. She recently completed a fellowship at the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership, where she prepared and led a think tank on state and vigilante violence for the 2014 Without Borders Conference, and produced and directed a theatrical piece titled Power from the Mouths of the Occupied. She is a Fulbright Scholarship recipient, was named the 2007 Mario Savio Activist of the Year, and received the Sidney Goldfarb Award. She earned a degree in religion and philosophy from UCLA. Will you please warmly and enthusiastically welcome Patrice Cullors. Thanks, everybody. Um, isn't it a great time to be alive? Yeah. What an honor. This is an, an, a moment that we should all be grateful for and proud of. Um, thanks for the round of applause for me, but I just want to make sure that y'all give yourselves a round of applause. So can you please clap for yourself for showing up today? I know um, many folks have been in the work for a while. Um, some folks started the work August 9th. Some people have sort of transformed where their work is currently going. And so I just want to honor um, every single 
body that's in this room in this moment and give a lot of thanks and praise um, for being alive and being able to fight. Uh, I want to spend my time um, talking about what is happening right now. Um, and uh, we'll give it a little bit of history. I'll give a little bit of historical context, but large in part what's happening across the country, specifically in Baltimore, um, and what's happening here in our own county, what work folks can do. And then I'm going to open it up for a Q&A for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we can talk and mingle afterwards. How's that sound? Great. On Friday, six Baltimore police officers were charged with crimes related to the arrest and death of Freddie Gray. I just want to take a moment um, to, to talk about uh, the fact that every 28 hours a black person is being murdered by the state. And some are saying in the first month of January it was every 18 hours. So if we could just take a moment to think about the families and the communities that have been most impacted by this violence. Just um, a moment of silence for Freddie Gray and uh, the rest of young black folks that have died at the hands of the police. Thank you. These charges only happen because folks have been out in the streets demanding for some sort of accountability. So let's just take a moment, right? These charges only happen because people went to the streets, and not just in Baltimore, but people went to the streets in Ferguson, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in Appalachia, in small towns and big cities across the country, black people and their allies have taken to the streets. And the call is Black Lives Matter. A very simple phrase, which you heard the origin of. Uh, but what so, I think, um, resonates so much for folks around that phrase is that the reality is black lives don't matter. And so the call is a pushback. The call is a challenge. Uh, the call is uh, both a response, but it's also a dream. It's also something that builds upon our imagination. What would, what would happen if black lives actually mattered? And while it's important that we hold these officers accountable for their acts of brutality, we must remember that accountability does not end with bringing criminal charges or even securing a convic conviction against these officers. As we remember, we fought for George Zimmerman to get arrested. We fought for him to get charges, and yet he was acquitted. With the officers who were uh, a part of the killing of Amadou Diallo, do you remember Amadou Diallo? Coming out of his house, took out his wallet, the cops thought it was a gun, shot 41 times. Those officers had charges, but they were released. So we are calling across the country um, for a different uh, understanding of what's needed in this moment. In many recent incidents involving law enforcement violence, we have focused our attention on individual accountability instead of the need for transformative institutional change. About 50 years ago, as uprisings spread across the country, the Kerner Commission issued a report stating the ongoing legacy of racial injustice in the country demanded remedy, not reaction. Yet, 50 years later, as black youth in Baltimore who are shut out of their classrooms and denied access to public transportation, and black adults who are shut out of employment opportunities took to the street following the killing of Freddie Gray, the local, state, and federal government response has once again been repression, reaction, not remedy. We stand in solidarity with the people of Baltimore and the millions of black people across the country who are tired of poverty, racism, and state-sanctioned murder. We recognize anger, fear, despair, and outcry as not just normal, but rather encouraging responses against a system that has offered silence, repression, or death. 
And this past year, we have seen the emergence of a movement to transform the ongoing reality of structural racism in this country. We call this movement the Black Lives Matter movement. Such a transformation requires a radical remaking, not just of police departments or the justice system, but of the country as a whole. In 1969, Ella Baker said, quote, in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become part of a society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. This means that we are going to have to learn to think in radical terms, getting down to and understanding the root cause. We need truth and reinvestment. By truth, we mean the country's institutional examination of the present day manifestations of a long history of racism and oppression. So I'm gonna just pause right here. I love an audience that snaps and hoops and hollers. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not sure if you're listening to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> So the idea um, that this country needs a radical shift, I just wanna make sure I'm an audience that believes that. Yeah. When founded, the United States was a slaveholding nation and it maintained the antebellum economy that was created to support through acts of mass organized violence. The separate and unequal status of black persons and other people of color after slavery were also perpetuated through violence, like the lynchings of thousands of black men, women, and children from the Civil War until World War II. Unjust laws, such as the black codes and written and unwritten Jim Crow segregation were maintained through the violence of legalized and extrajudicial killings, incarceration, and forced labor. While legalized segregation is thankfully a relic of the past, de facto segregation, disparate opportunity according to race and organized state violence against black people and other people of color persists. The disproportionate incarceration of black and brown people and the murder of black people every 28 hours by law enforcement or vigilantes serve as stark reminders of this reality. So we live in a county that is the biggest jailer in the world. LA County is the biggest jailer in the world. Housing at this point, anywhere from 17,000 to 20,000 people inside its eight facilities. So this is not just a national problem, this is a local problem. The truth of this country's past and present must be connected to the reimagining of its policies and institutions toward a process of reconciliation and reinvestment. Reinvestment means shifting resources away from the criminal justice system and other punitive government systems. This also means police. We cannot separate the two. It means shifting resources towards education, employment, healthcare, and trauma-informed healing that can help survivors of ongoing structural racism and poverty. I have spent more than half my life as a community organizer, advocating for change in the prison system in Los Angeles. My first brush with the system was as a child experiencing my father cycling in and out until he passed away just nine months after he was released in December 2009. I didn't really become aware of the depth of abuse inside the system until I was 16. My brother, who was four years older than me, was arrested. He was incarcerated inside the LA County jails where he was almost killed by the sheriffs. They beat him, they tortured and brutalized him. This was my awakening and I was compelled to action. I sought out mentors, established a network, and over a period of 11 years, I learned the craft of community organizing. In 2011, I came across an 86-page document. It was the ACLU's lawsuit against the Sheriff's Department. Using this report, I created STAINED, 
and intimate portrayal of state violence. A piece of performance art designed to bring attention to this issue. After six months of touring this piece, I connected with many people who had been impacted by sheriff violence. And at that time, decided to develop a group, which is now Dignity and Power Now. If there's Dignity and Power Now folks in the audience, hoop and holler. <laughs> Expanding the organizational, psychological, and motivational capacity to end state violence meant developing five other projects that used art, research, resilience, practices, and leadership development as centerpieces in this work. Dignity and Power Now was created to be the principal organization for a multifaceted, trauma-informed, healing, motivated movement to end state violence and mass incarceration. Where are we now? We've achieved quite a bit, but more is always needed. We continue to work to affect change. We demand for a civilian oversight commission with real power. And I have plants in the audience that will talk about what that means. Uh, we want mental health diversion and a halt to the $3.5 billion jail plan that this county is trying to build. Black, brown, poor communities and our allies, there's a need for us to all fight back. There's a need for us to all believe that this county could look different, that this county can really reinvest in communities. I am proud of the work that I've been able to lead in Los Angeles and even prouder of the team that has grown out of fighting for greater accountability of the Sheriff's Department. Dignity and Power Now currently has a core leadership team made up of staff and volunteer members who have worked diligently to tell the stories for their loved ones. This team has been able to be resilient against all odds and I have been honored to work for us for the last three years. Our main demand has been civilian oversight of the Sheriff's Department, and in December of last year, we actually won that demand. As American democracy is continu continuously compromised by law enforcement that has very little checks and balances, I've felt compelled to support a national movement that is focused on pushing for local government to reinvest and, the dig and reinvest in the dignity of communities of color, black communities in particular. No movement is ahistorical, and no movement is without strategy. When folks in Ferguson made the choice to demand accountability, and when local law enforcement's response was to tear gas and rubber bullet a community that was grieving, I understood that there needed to be an intervention and a discussion about state violence. Mostly, state violence and mass incarceration are seen as two separate issues, but I argue they are two sides of the same coin. The police arrest people who end up in jail or prison. The amount of funding that has been poured into law enforcement, jails, and prisons far exceeds the lack of investment made into black and poor communities. We cannot com compartmentalize one apparatus from the other. We can't have jails without police, and police without jails. In the last nine months, one thing I have been clear on is the need for a national network to be established that can help support victims and survivors of state violence to build their capacity <laughs> and support their leadership in order to change the culture of Americans, America's relationship to law enforcement in jails and prisons. I'm proud to say that I have embarked on a new venture I am the Truth and Reinvestment uh, Director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, where we are building a national network of survivors of state violence. And lastly, I'll say truth and, and reinvestment must lead to abolition. And I'm gonna read the definition of abolition. Abolition is a noun, the action or an act of abolishing a system, practice, or institution. Abolition is not just ending of a system. It's also the act of redeveloping, reimagining what kind of world we want to be living in. A world that is rooted in the truth that all our, our lives 
deserve the, spool, the full spectrum of living. Abolition should be what we aspire to. It should be our dream. The idea of no human being in cages, no more police occupying city streets, that our families will get the health care they deserve and work a job that pays them a livable wage. These are, are these are the times we can aspire to, believe and dream up something that is radically different than what we have been currently living in. Thank you so much. Microphones are coming. Please raise your hand. Uh, we need a microphone in front of you so that the people who are streaming can hear. We'll try to go back, backwards and forwards. Please. There's the first one. Go ahead. Please. Oh, I'm okay. Uh, first, I, I just want to tell you how inspiring you are and how grateful. I am for your work, and I'm sure all of us. I mean, it is just so needed and incredible. Thank you. Um, I, the pieces that you talked about in terms of the transformation that we're aiming for, I think are critical. Mm -hmm. And I think that we also need to look at what we can do in our schools in terms of social emotional education. <laughs> because if we can begin there, if we can begin when, when children are in pre-K and kindergarten, all the way up, teaching them empathy, connecting with each other, anger management, impulse control, all of these kinds of social emotional skills, bringing in also restorative justice practices, the, the connection piece. I think we have an incredible opportunity here to transform from the beginning, prevention. And, and just, you know, I think that's a really critical piece as well. So I too appreciate the work that you do. I think it's phenomenal. But I was wondering if you could say a little bit about um, how you're addressing the fact that our prison industry is increasingly becoming a for-profit industry and the fact that we have debtors prisons in this country, which seem to be unconstitutional to mm -hmm. say the least. Could you talk a little bit about what you're doing in response to, to that issue? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, well, lots of people are doing lots of things in response to that. Uh, one place that you're seeing it is in colleges that have invested um, uh, bonds and things in private prisons in particular. So there's lots of uh, young people across the country that have uh, created prison divestment campaigns. Also, um, Color of Change, who's an ally of Black Lives Matter, has um, been working on prison divestment as well. And so I think, you know, especially when I go speak at colleges, I, I, lots of students always ask, well, how do we get involved? I'm like, you should look at what your college is practicing. Um, and is it in alignment with your politics? And if it isn't, you should ensure that it is. And so I spoke at Hampshire College uh, with the other two Black Lives Matter co-founders, and they had been pushing for prison div divestment, and their president wouldn't speak to them. And so they plotted beforehand. They found us and said, you know, can we essentially take the microphone and have this conversation because the president's going to be there. And so we allowed them to take the microphone to bring these issues. And since then, the president has been speaking with them and they're on a track of trying to figure out prison divestment. Hi, I was just um, wondering if you could expand on the idea of um, the value of shutting down the streets. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you. That's a great, great question. So when I, I went to the UK um, in January on a, on a Black Lives Matter tour in the UK um, and met lots of families who'd been impacted by state violence. And although the UK, most of their law enforcement does not carry police on the streets, um, they were still killing folks um, through force. So breaking backs, um, choking people, and illegal chokeholds, 
And it was, um, you know, many of the community in, communities in the UK asked, well, what, what do you think is different about um, what's happening right now in America than what's happening in the UK? And I said, well, we're out in the streets. And um, there's something about um, taking up space in a way that challenges um, who, what we're allowed to do and who we, who we're allowed to take, where we're allowed to take up space. And I think there's something about um, pushing uh, our, our local government to see us literally, right? Literally seeing people. I think what was so, although there's lots of criticism Occupy, what was so powerful Occupy is, is the taking back of the streets. I mean, we literally pay for the streets that are paved. We pay for the, the institutions we go to. These, this is our money. Um, it's, and, and as a collective, I think we have every right, right, to be in the streets and be out in the streets. And I actually think it's the only reason why we're in this moment today that we're calling this thing a movement, right? If we were just sort of sitting and, and um, having policies changed all day, which lots of people do, and it's a really amazing work, uh, we don't call that a movement. Um, what we call a movement is the ability to change the hearts and minds of an entire country and nation and visibilizing communities that have most been invisible. Congratulations on the Ella Baker. That's the best title of a job I've heard. <laughs> okay, Truth and Reinvestment. So you're doing an awesome job of telling the truth. Can you spend a couple minutes telling us about the investment or the reinvestment strategies? Yes. So um, there's many names that we can call reinvestment. We can call it a redistribution. We can call it reparations. Um, I want to actually uplift uh, something that's just come out of Chicago. And um, Chicago torture survivors. Um, called for reparations almost a decade ago. And we're pushing Chicago City Council to literally provide um, um, both a financial package, but also um, emotional resources, right, back into the communities that had been tortured by John Burge, who was a captain of the police department who had been trained in the military and brought those uh, tactics he used overseas to the uh, specifically black folks in Chicago. Um, because of this current movement, though the reparations campaign actually uh, was uplifted and moved forward and they just won a $5.5 .5 million reparations package in the city of Chicago. Um, we are utilizing that model as Black Lives Matter to uh, look at other cities that have had and used similar tactics against um, most marginalized communities, and we're in the middle of strategizing around how we can fight for uh, reinvestment, reparations, whatever you want to call it, um, back into our, our local municipalities. And so what's that going to, that's going to look differently in each city. And uh, just so folks know, we have 23 chapters across the country. So each chapter is going to develop that model, and we're going to have a chapter retreat in June. But one of the ways we're going to do it in Los Angeles is um, one of our members is actually um, sits on the Human Rights Commission in LA County. So she's gonna open up that space to develop a series of um, uh, essentially um, uh, speak outs for community members to talk about the impacts both incarceration and state violence has had and uh, imagine demands that we can make of the city and the county around what reparations can look like. Yeah, yeah thank you for your work. Um, I'm wondering, these protests that are occurring, they're not as spontaneous as we think. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> they're, they're being organized. And the people that I see organizing these is mostly um, like the Answer Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I haven't seen a lot of protests by other groups. It, it's, a, it's a problem when you're looking for these type of activities to find that the only group who's really doing that at a, on a consistent and regular basis is um, the Answer Coalition. And like last, um, yesterday, not yesterday, the day before I went to a protest with, um, and we, for on police brutality with a group of anarchists. So, what groups are out there doing it? What does it mean to be out there on the streets? Um, what type of people do we have to, um, are we willing to work with? Is there a way to make it a more uh, a safer environment? People can feel more comfortable coming out there. Um, you know, what's happening in that regard? Mm -hmm. 
So I'll just disagree that it's not just Answer Coalition that's um, organizing these protests, certainly not in Baltimore. Um, and I would say that uh, it's young people who've been at the margins who are um, both spontaneous but also sitting together in rooms figuring out what's the next place of action, and next point of action. Um, maybe answer is most visible, but that's not the only group that's, that's organizing it. Uh, yesterday, the Black Lives Matter Los Angeles chapter, well one, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles has been organizing protests since um, Trayvon Martin. So since the acquittal, we actually shut down Rodeo Drive and Beverly Hills about a week after the acquittal. Um, and, 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 and in general, we've been out in the streets ever since. Um, both in Los Angeles, but also we have a Black Lives Matter Pasadena chapter um, who's been fighting for justice for Kendrick McDade, who is the young um, black brother who was murdered by the Pasadena Police Department and um, was shot by an officer who was sitting in his car, uh, didn't even come out of his car, and then ran Kendrick over. And so BLM Pasadena has been at the police department protesting, um, has uh, had a significant amount of protests out in the streets. I think we need to think about protests differently too. Um, mass mobilizations aren't the only way we protest. Um, if you've seen, there's been this thing called Black Brunch that has been created, which is essentially came out of Oakland with young black folks who started to interrupt um, Sunday brunch where mostly white folks um, had their <laughs> Uh, had their have their respectable brunches and didn't have to see the atrocities happening in Ferguson, and this black brunch has gone across the country. It's spread. It's been pretty amazing. It went to St. Louis and went to New York, and we did black brunch yesterday in Beverly Hills. Um, this is important um, because it's about protest is about disrupting what is happening, um, both trying to disrupt the violence that's happening, but it's also protest is about disrupting apathy. And so there's, there's mass mobilizing, which is important, but there's also those moments of protest or dissent that are small, like showing up to a brunch, you know, essentially what black brunchers do is they read the names of people who have been murdered. And they, they see it as ceremony, as a ritual. Um, and it's about taking back agency and it's also about disrupting people's apathy. So I think we should be creative about how we protest. Um, I was a part of an action uh, and Ferguson um, what was called Ferguson October. It was like four days of protests where we did a mass mobilization, but then we went across the city and the county and we protested in different places. We protested at DWP, um, we protested at Walmart. And so we try to make the connections around the violence against black people being, like I said on the video, more than just law enforcement violence, but the violence of poverty, right? The violence of racism and how that plays in our lives. And so we shut down a Walmart uh, both in um, solidarity with the workers of Walmart, but also we shut down the Walmart in solidarity with John Crawford, who was murdered in a, in a Walmart in, in the pet, petting aisle, right? So it was this, just trying to be more intersectional in our approach, um, I think is super important. <laughs> Thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for bringing the information to us this morning. And I'm wondering if you could make your remarks printed so that we could oh. all have them, yep. because you mentioned several organizations that I'm unaware of, and I'm sure there may be others who are unaware. It would be helpful. Great. And <clears throat> I admire the work that's going on in trying to change things. I heard a remark this morning on Meet the Press that is disturbing to say the least, and that is the fact that we're spending infinitely more money in the Middle East dealing with their problems than we spend on the inner cities in the United States. And that seems to me to be pretty upside down and that we need to, as a people, begin to make different demands and start to change that, starting, of course, as this lady says, with education. If we would start to put the kind of money into education mm -hmm. that we're now doing in other things like jails, we could turn this upside down in no time at all. Mm -hmm. And I am grateful for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna, um, so I wanna make sure, because we only have till, we have like six minutes or something. Mark Anthony, I wanna make sure you talk about call to action around folks calling their uh, working group member. So if 
we can take Mark and well, this response over here. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. If we could take Mark Anthony, he's the plant that hasn't been raising his hand, so I had to call him out. <laughs> good morning, everyone. How are you? It's good to see everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, so, as Patrice named, uh, we're in this moment of shaping civilian oversight. We want it and now we're trying to make sure it has the features that we believe are the most important based on what we've seen around the country, including subpoena power, including no law enforcement being uh, on that commission, including it being a nine-member board, four of which are selected by the community and community organizations that have been doing this work, um, including directing the, the current functions of the Inspector General, which was created last year to audit, report, and, and review uh, and investigate the Sheriff's Department. Um, so so th those are some of the features that we think are really important. In order to make this happen, we need your support. Um, a seven-member working group has been established uh, to uh, come up with these features, and we've been there every two weeks to, sh to shape uh, some of the language of this proposal. Um, but each person, each district has its own representative. Um, and so I think we're in Pasadena, where we're district, we're Antonovich. Right. So uh, Brent Braun, would be uh, your representative. And what we would need you to do is call Brent Braun and tell him you support Dignity and Power Now's demand for civilian oversight, civilian oversight with power, um, something that has our five demands on it. You can get um, his number. Um, I can give it to you. <laughs> um, we've been calling these folks. We have a campaign called A Thousand Calls in 60 Days. And it's been our goal to make sure that folks um, that these working group members that know that the community supports us. In April, we had several um, town halls where this working group was shopping around its proposal for civilian oversight. At every single town hall, folks overwhelmingly supported our demands. And so we want to keep that momentum going because in June, we're going to see more of these, um, we're going to see more of this proposal, particularly as it goes to the county supervisors. And that's going to be a key, key fight for us. So just give me one second while I find Mr. Braun's number. And you can write it down. So it's 310-871-6431. That's 310-871-6431. His, His name is Brent, B-R-E-N-T. Braun, B-R-A-U-N. And you can find more information out at dignityempowernow.org. So can I get a raise of hands of who's going to call Brent Braun? <laughs> Great. Call him Monday morning, not today, because it'll go to voicemail. <laughs> so we have three more minutes, which I think means one more question. Yeah, so um, do, is that how you want me to close out, or do you want to get one more question? Okay, so... Thanks very much for your wonderful leadership and inspiring presence uh, with your team here today. <laughs> um, uh, yesterday, Ed Bacon said that he thought that there were uh, clear impacts on our emergence as a people, as a nation, maybe as a world, mm -hmm. related to these actions that we see that you and others and, and many are taking now. And I wonder if you see, for example, in the indictment of the police officers um, in Baltimore as one of the dimensions that comes to the minds of us who are, of us who are hopeful that change can actually take place in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I'm an old guy. Mm -hmm. and, and it can, can take place now, coming forward, through work like you're doing. Do you see places where, apart from what you've already said in this great organization uh, that you're suggesting, in the law, in the in the legal system, in the judicial system, uh, and other legislative areas, where we need to keep pushing and, and bringing the pressure that uh, is is I I agree vital for change. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean I think that it's definitely a sign that um, the powers that be are listening, and I I think we we have to just because history shows we can't um, get bogged down in sort of the individual officers that are being charged, we have to think broader, and that's the call to action, is what's the broad sweep that has to happen? What's the radical shift that has to happen? And I think we're in that moment where enough of us collectively are calling for that, and that can happen. Patrice. 
Real quickly, uh, oh, a, oh, quick can, plug, a quick from? plug. Yes. Uh, while we're working on oversight, also on May 13th, you know, we're trying to get oversight of the sheriff's deputies, but the sheriff is putting in a, a request for a huge increase in the sheriff's department budget. Mm -hmm. At a time when populations in the jails are falling, we're trying to divert people from the system. So May 13th, at uh, the Board Kenneth, of Supervisors. Hall, uh, Hall of, Kenneth Hahn Hall of Administration, we all need to be there and speak out against this massive increase for the sheriff in the midst of when we're trying to change the system. That's great. So it's 11, right? I know that y'all told me 11, so I'm being a stickler on time. So I'll just close with um, a few call to actions. One, calling Brent Braun is key. Showing up to the County Board of Supervisors May 13th is key. But also, I would, um, if you want to learn more about Black Lives Matter Pasadena and the support that you can give to that chapter, I think is really important, especially um, because of the history of the Pasadena Police Department, right? It's often easy for us to be like, well, that's happening in Baltimore and Ferguson, um, but it's actually happening here in LA County as well, and here particularly in Pasadena. So um, come up to me afterwards, let's talk about what support that you, you can lend to the local Black Lives Matter chapters. Um, and I just wanna once again thank everybody for being present in this moment. I'm gonna actually, if you're able to stand, I'm gonna ask you to stand because we're gonna close off how I usually close off. Every event, every march, every rally, we've done this. Uh, I did this inside, um, well, folks were set to go meet with the president in the Oval Office, and uh, we also have done this in Harlem. And so we take this chant wherever we go and it's a chant that uh, this generation movement is really abiding by, and it's by Asada Shakur. Uh, and it's just a call and response, so I'm gonna say it and then you're gonna repeat it back to me. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains.